So maybe I think we shall start, actually. <coughs> um, we have one more expert, actually, who is going to join in person, but he's trying to find his way here. He just informed me that he, he's somewhere. Ah, here he is. Yes. <laughs> Yay, yes. <coughs> so good afternoon for all. Uh, thank you for actually coming to this session called the Opportunities of Cross-Border Data Flow. DFFT for development sessions. Uh, my name is Datsushi Yamanaka. I'm a senior advisor on digital transformation at JICA, who is actually privileged to be a moderator for this particular session. Um, we actually have a very distinct actually, experts here from the government of developing countries, and also the private sectors, international organizations, uh, umbrella organization for the development partners. Uh, so we could have a very interesting discussions and we urge you actually to think about critical questions so we can throw at them. Um, the, uh, the sequence of the, the event is gonna be, we're gonna have an opening remark from uh, Mr. Uh, Tajima Hitoshi. Mm -hmm. He's a CDO of Japan International Cooperation Agencies, JICA, uh, which is actually Japanese cooperation agencies for uh, helping the developing countries. And basically, he's my boss, basically. So he's gonna have an opening session, uh, followed by uh, different speakers, uh, who is going to give a lightning talk of the contextualizing the what it means for DFFT for development or data transactions for development. And then we're gonna go into the Q&A sessions, uh, moderated Q&A sessions that I'm going to actually throw them a few questions. But after that, we're gonna open the floor to you. And we also urge basically active participation from the online participants. So uh, we actually have the online facilitator, Chrissy. She's going to facilitate the process online. So please actually send questions to Chrissy uh, in, in the chat box so that she could actually moderate the session online. So let's start, and uh, may I actually pass it to uh, Mr. Tojima Hitoshi, Chief Digital Officer of Japan International Corporation, for his opening remark. tojima san please. Uh, thank you, Atsushi. Uh, good afternoon, konnichiwa, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this roundtable session on opportunities of cross-border data flow, DFFT for development. As uh, Atsushi introduced me, I'm Tojima Hitoshi, Chief Development Digital Officer of JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency, a bilateral institution committed to advancing the socio-economic development of emerging nations through Japanese ODA, Official Development Assistance. At JICA, we have embraced digital technologies to enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of our cooperation program always overarching goal of helping our partner countries achieve tangible development outcomes. In 2022, we introduced our DX vision and launched a practice known as Global Agenda for DX, as you can see at the entrance of this forum. Their primary objective is harnessing digital transformation to improve the well-being of all individuals and to build resilient societies that ensure safety and provide diverse opportunities. However, to fully unlock the potential of DX, we acknowledge that data, often referred to as the new gold, must flow freely, securely, and with trust. Since 2019, the government of Japan has been at the forefront of promoting the concept of data free flow with trust, DFFT, emphasizing the transformative role of data in what late Prime Minister Abe aptly termed Society 5.0. We firmly believe that data is a critical asset for the development of nations, a powerful tool that can accelerate progress toward the SDGs. Yet, data alone is insufficient. It must flow and transact securely to realize its full potential. In this endeavor, we are also mindful of the challenges of data governance, sovereignty, cybersecurity, privacy, and personal information protection. In this session, we have gathered experts from government, public and private sectors, civil society, 
and importantly, all of you, both here in Kyoto and participating online. We encourage open and free discussions on the challenges and opportunities of data flow and transactions, particularly within the context of de developing countries. Your inputs are invaluable as we collectively work towards creating models that maximize the benefit of DFFT. Lastly, I extend my sincere gratitude to our co-organizers, Daya and Google, for their invaluable support in facilitating this crucial discussion. I anticipate today's conversation will be engaging and constructive, making a substantial contribution to the advancement of DFFT for development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tojima-san, for your opening remark. So now we're going to go into the lightning sessions. Um, we're going to have five distinct actually, experts here. Uh, we're going to have first uh, Ms. Miyata Mayumi. She's the chief representative of JICA Tunisia office, but she used to be a director of the STI DX office in JICA. She's going to talk about the DFFT for development concept of DFFT. And then we're going to pass it on to uh, Mr. John Filver and Sengimana. Uh, he's the chief technical advisor of Africa CDC. Uh, he's going to be also online. And then we're going to pass it to Gordon Karema to my left here. He's uh, director general of the Ministry of ICT and Innovations in Rwanda. And then uh, to Kay, uh, <coughs> Catherine McGreen, uh, McGuen, Kay McGuen. She's a senior pro uh, policy advisor of Digital Impact Alliance. And not, uh, the last but not the least, uh, Mr. John Jack Sahel, Asia Pacific Head of Content Policy and Global Head of Telecommunication Policies of Google. So Miyata-san, can I pass the floor to you? Maybe your mic is muted. Ah, sorry. Can can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. And and also the uh, I'm showing one slide. Yes, it's fine. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much. This is Miata from JICA. Uh, I, I'm very very delighted to be uh, joining this session as as an ex uh, director in charge of the ex in all the DICA program, uh, projects and programs. And one of the things that I did with my colleagues uh, uh, is to uh, is to conceptualize a so-called DFFT in the development context. And here I would like to explain this slide, which is also made available to our session page on the IGF website as a background paper. Um, so. Um, so the concept of the FFT for development, as we propose, um, is summarized in this sheet. And so the background is that developed countries are uh, positioning data utilization as a source of national power, and and they're promoting uh, them to get more data, they're promoting them, and then getting through getting more data and circulating them more data, and then get getting uh, more values at the end. On the other hand, there are still many areas in developing countries where. Uh, the infrastructure and the environments are still at fragile uh, stage and not uh, maybe at that level. So what is DFFT for development? Is to realize data-driven uh, socioeconomic development of developing countries through enabling them to participate into international data uh, market in safe and trusted ways. So in order to push this agenda, how can we uh, do that. So on the right hand side, we have laid out some elements here. Um, and so in the, the white uh, space, uh, this is a kind of typical system uh, architecture uh, diagram starting uh, bottom from infrastructure, data layer, data integration platform and data space services and having overreaching uh, regulations institution on the right side. And the Blue, uh, blue uh, areas are, are um, blue highlight, highlighted areas are, are the kind of entry points where or we can, um, uh, we thought uh, quite useful to um, uh, kind of uh, uh, package DFAFT together with our, our, our development programs, for example. So support for system operation uh, deals with the regulation 
regulations institution. Some of the uh, intervention in our programs uh, deal with uh, digital uh, strategy for an entire country or region uh, or entire sector or industry. So in those uh, exercises, uh, it's, it's good to uh, think about the cross-border data flows uh, in a trusted ways. And another, uh, uh, secondly, is the data utilization. So we have a number of projects where we are dealing with uh, specific applications in energy or in, in energy or mobility or in health, those uh, specific for their specific purposes. And, in, and when we support this, uh, uh, when we implement those programs, we also anticipate a future cross-border data uh, exchanges and so that uh, we don't hinder their potential of data utilization. So uh, um, here are the kind of framework that uh, uh, for thinking that we like to uh, propose and some of the uh, uh, detailed explanations are uh, giving uh, on the following slide. I'm not going to uh, explain all of them. And uh, in the session, I would like to, um, I would be happy to share some of the concrete examples and the challenges. I would like to hear from other panels and the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miyata-san, for the concise actually <coughs> concept of uh, explanation, the concept of DFFT for development. As Miyata-san mentioned, the data without flow, data without transaction is data, no data, right? No gold, basically. So it's very, very important for us to see what would be the safe and trusted ways of transacting data. So that is really the concept behind the DFFT for development. So now let me also pass it to John Philibert and Sengimana. He's a chief, a chief digital advisor for the CDC Africa. So she's actually advising on a lot of health-related data, which is critical in terms of privacy and also safeguarding as well. So, John Philibert, can you actually have a lightning talk for you for five minutes? Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Atsushi-san. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So it's uh, half past 11 p.m. here, and I'm only here because uh, Atsushi-san is my good friend. And today he's surrounded by uh, two other very good friends and colleagues, Kay McGowan and uh, Gordon Kalema. Otherwise, I'm sure there is enough expertise in the room to dissect this topic. My name is Jean Philippe Sengimana. I'm the Chief Digital Advisor at the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, and also work as, serve as Senior Advisor at the Digital Impact Alliance. Um, so the theme of cross-border data is extremely interesting and timely in the African context because of several reasons, but I will only talk about three reasons. Number one, Africa is uniting in the world's largest free trade area. Previously fragmented into uh, 54 markets, since 20... A historic shift is happening to consumers. And while most of the other types of cross-border infrastructure, such as roads and ra railways are lagging behind, digital infrastructure powered by wireless networks, satellite uh, that are border agnostic constitute the only means to meaningfully interconnect the continent in the immediate term. So uh, there is no question that uh, cross-border uh, free flow of data will benefit Africa's vision to unite into uh, a digital single market. Uh, number two, I want to address the issue of openness and sovereignty and protection of data. Um, openness is good. It's the only thing that will allow us to really harness the benefit of data. But we are extremely conscious also that um, there are many forces, state and non-state backed forces, as my previous uh, predecessor uh, speaker talked about, that seek to um, exploit uh, the data as the new oil coming from Africa. So African regulators and policymakers must balance openness while protecting um, not just uh, the sovereignty, but also the privacy, the security, and the digital rights of the users. And the only way to do that is through collaboration with uh, between different stakeholders, 
who can enable appropriate data flows while safeguarding sensitive information. And this is particularly important when it comes to health data. People, as they move across borders, they need continuity of care, but at the same time, they can also transmit uh, uh, pathogens and uh, propagate outbreaks uh, leading to pandemics. So that control that balances protection uh, and openness is very important. And there is, it's a challenge, not just an African challenge, but a global challenge uh, to be able to handle. Number three, uh, IGF is there to enable a global digital uh, data governance. And um, I'm, I'm happy to see that this year, uh, the African voices are there, uh, but this needs to include, be increased and be strengthened. Uh, Africans uh, must lead in governing cross-border data to meet the continent's needs, first and foremost, while enabling the global uh, interconnected economy. By working together, we can build consensus on solutions uh, such as localized health data governor uh, storage, increase internet exchange points, and harmonized uh, regional data regulations. So those are the three points I wanted to submit uh, and, and really looking forward to a great conversation and a great IGF. Thanks so much. Over to you. Thank you, so th <clears throat> thank you, John Fibre. And see, he actually had a great actually insight into the balance between the op uh, openness and also protecting the you know privacies, but also about sovereignties of the countries as well. But you know, he also mentioned about how the Africa is moving forward with one digital market. So if we are lagging behind other countries in, in the world, actually, if we are lagging behind, I think Africa, as in many of the innovations such as like M-Pesa or mobile monies, I think they may actually have the best example of it. So what do you think, Gordon, Mr. Gordon Kaleba? He's a DG of Ministry of ICT. Oh. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here uh, on this uh, conference. Um, I want to, first of all, thank the organizers of the session. I think it sits at the right timing. Um, at a time where we are discussing the internet we want, I think it is equally critical that we, are start, we start discussing the kind of data ecosystem we want. Um, greetings from Rwanda. And I want to give my remarks from the perspective of uh, a policymaker. Um, I come from uh, the Ministry of ICT Innovation. We do policies, we put in place frameworks. And as my, my predecessor speakers mentioned, um, as, as, we, as the global economies attempt to move into um, data value, creating processes, creating frameworks, uh, it all starts with the role of respective countries. What is it that you do as a country and what is it that you do as an individual in contribution to this ideal data ecosystem? And definitely we can see that we, we are moving from a gray space, a kind of a phase where the discussion around data is quite uncertain. It's something that people have been shy away from talking about. And increasingly, we are seeing now countries and organizations and individuals being more open. So how do we encourage that? As a policymaker, and I want to use some examples of our own experience back home, um, we put in place a data protection and privacy law um, two, th two, two years ago. And we realized that before we get into the actual implementation, we needed to give an ample time for people to be comfortable and understand the topic. So we gave a sort of a grace period of two years. And I'm glad to mention that today, on 15th, we are, this month of October, we are celebrating the Cybersecurity Month. And on 15th, that's, gonna, that's when we are going to be having our cutoff date. So um, I wanted 
Now with that, I wanted to highlight the role of having a policy, policies in place. So we need to be able to have policies, laws, and institutions strengthened. But then, importantly, we need also to realize that we are working with people, we are working with humans. Before the balance between going with what the policy law says, what the law says, and also allowing people to be comfortable with the topic and take ownership is very key. So the transition we've had has taught us a lot of lessons that I'll be able to share maybe in the next opportunity. But for us, it was a highlight. People first before policies. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Gordon. So it's very, very important actually to see the perspective of the people first. I think a lot of IZF is based on the human rights issues. So it's really important that how can you actually ensure the people first policies in terms of the FFT for development is also be entertained on that. So may I pass it to the dial, uh, Ms. Kay. She's actually a policy, senior policy advisor on Digital Impact Alliance. Basically, Digital Impact Alliance is an umbrella organization for the development partners in the area of digital technology or digital support. So Kay, can you actually give us perspectives on it? Yes, of course. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first off, I'd like to thank uh, my friends at JICA for organizing this session and the partnership with DIAL and um, framing this important uh, conversation. As Atsushi san just mentioned, uh, the Digital Impact Alliance, or DIAL, as we're better known, is a platform for public and uh, private development funders to work together to improve investments in digital technology in order to accelerate socioeconomic development and ensure that digital policies and systems are grounded in the rights and aspirations of people. So I, too, am really happy to hear the theme here. Um, so this is, it's wonderful to have an excuse to visit this uh, beautiful country, beautiful city, but this is also a hugely important topic. Data free flows with trust are often associated in policy circles with international trade and commerce, um, in particular among and between the world's largest economies. And while this is of course true, it's also an incomplete way to think about data free flows with trust. Right? Um, this idea of establishing the rules and mechanisms to enable safe cross-border data sharing also has tremendous potential to advance um, socioeconomic development for everyone. Um, and that includes all countries, but it's, I think, especially relevant right now to countries and communities that are working to close gaps such as access to formal financial services, quality education, universal health care. And then when you move beyond borders, uh, the, you know, the impacts of climate change and uh, disease or pandemic are just a couple of examples that feel particularly tangible to all of us today. Um, so all to say the opportunities for digital free flows with trust to solve global challenges, I would say are limited. And so I was asked to speak about the opportunities as well as the challenges. And I, I do truly believe that we can't even quite fathom what the opportunities are, uh, especially with the advent of, of AI as we're seeing this. Fortunately, um, I think the challenges, while they are real and they're formidable, they are not limitless, at least I hope not. Um, I'm not naive. Uh, we've already heard people talk about the fact that there are going to be data sets uh, that countries will not share, or at least they will not share broadly, due to national security concerns or to protect economic interests. And yet we also know that there are vast amounts of digital data that could be safely shared for the benefit of humanity and people while respecting uh, these security issues and sovereignty. Um, so economists like to talk about stranded assets, right? Resources whose value are not fully realized. And I like this analogy because data, whether it's locked up in a commercial platform or in a government um, server, you know, I think as we move more and more into the digital era, data is the ultimate stranded asset. And I think that's, you know, we've heard references to data um, being similar to oil or gold, 
Um, but you know, in fact, it's, it's not, right? It's a non-rivalrous reef source. It's, um, it's not finite. There's no scarcity concern that should incentivize hoarding. Um, in theory, data is infinitely reusable. And of course, I don't need to explain to anybody in this room or online um, the just exponential rate at which new data is being generated now, which is only um, going to increase. So when you think about the unrealized power of stranded data assets to provide the insights and create solutions for both global and domestic challenges, I think harmonizing um, both data sharing within borders, but data sharing across borders is a really urgent priority that doesn't get the attention it deserves. And I do applaud the government of Japan for keeping this on the global policy agenda. Um, so I would argue that the, the real challenge um, to unleashing the power of data to advance human development, it's not technical, although there's a lot of technical work to be done, but it's trust, right? Which is why I think DFFT is so aptly named. Um, we know that today's geopolitical realities mean that some of these trust divides are not going to be closed, at least not in the foreseeable future. But I'd bet that most trust deficits around data can be addressed with serious investment in building and governing data sharing models and tools that give data holders the confidence they need. And these are data holders, they could be commercial actors or public institutions, but I think we can find the tools and the rules, so to speak, to unlock useful data safely, responsibly, and as you guys have put it, to let it flow. Thank you. Thank you, Kay, for that actually exponential growth of the data is really something that we would like to explore. And then what Kay actually mentioned about tools for actually safeguarding and utilizing this. I think this is going to be a very, very pertinent topic for the next speaker, uh, Mr. John Jack Shahel. He's uh, from Google. So oftentimes, Google has been criticized, maybe, from the circles, saying, OK, this is actually data oligopolies. But at the same time, I think tools and also some of the services and products that they can offer has also had tremendous, actually, potentials for developing countries as well. So can I pass the floor to you, sir? Thank you very much. Um, yes, I think you can hear me. Um, and thank you, uh, Asushi and the Japanese government for uh, organizing this, this session. And it's really good to, to see many of you in the room, including some, some faces that I've seen since uh, very early IGFs. So thanks for being back. Um, so I wanted to share our perspective and, and um, touch in particular on public policy framework, you know, following on a little bit from what Gordon was saying and, and hopefully we'll, we'll have a good uh, dialogue taking it a little bit further. And when I think about this topic, I think about information. Um, you know, it's a really timely discussion to have because it's about, on one hand, how we protect our users, how we reinforce their trust, but also how we can boost our economies and making the most of the global nature of the internet and of information flows, something we haven't always had, something that the global south hasn't always had. And so we need to think about how we can capitalize on all those the positives in these debates as well. It's quite obvious, I think, to all of us that today data flows underpin a lot of our day-to-day -day activities, whether economic or personal. Um, you know, the, the, the value and the convenience of the global internet uh, rely on the free flow of information, whether it's because we can collaborate, like today, with a, a, a conference call that brings colleagues from uh, Rwanda and other parts of the world to just talk to us as if we were in the same room, pretty much, although it's a very, very big screen to see Jean Philbert. Um, or, you know, being able to buy or sell uh, items online to obtain information, et cetera, et cetera. The ability to work seamlessly, to transact, even when we have massive challenges like we've just had with the pandemic, we were able to maintain uh, economic activities and also some semblance of social activities in ways that we just couldn't have thought about just 10 or 20 years ago. And we need to think about how we preserve all that good whilst also having the right protections in place. And I think that goes to the heart of this debate, because threats to data continue to grow. 
Um, on one hand, you've got you know trust deficits between users and a company, uh, or indeed between users and a country or foreign countries and foreign organizations. People being worried about data misuse, and we're at an important inflection points in these debates. Now, if we think about it from a legal and policy framework, companies largely rely on contracts for transfers, and contracts have their place, but they're not necessarily right for every transfer, and they don't all do much to ensure trust between governments uh, or, or our users. And so we really need to think deep down, how can we avoid a world where we have information winners and information losers, privacy winners and privacy losers? Uh, we need to get into a situation where we don't have countries that have access to new and innovative technologies and countries that don't. And the only way to, that, that to avoid that is to avoid artificial barriers to access information and to access technology at physical borders. Instead, we can think and we should think about ways that ensure, that both ensure privacy and facilitate cross-border data flows. And I think we see that also when, you know, recently we've got the, the, the public consciousness focused on things like generative AI. Um, and I think that's thrown up considerations about some products that have had privacy built in, you know, privacy by design, and the need for that to happen and to build it into this whole new wave of transformative products that we're, we're seeing it. And that approach of privacy for design has allowed a number of, of uh, product companies to launch new products with privacy built in thinking about local privacy laws and how to meet privacy expectations and how to reinforce users' trust. And we really need now to think about that as we expand the system. We need to get to a better place because data transfer underlies so much of, of what we do today as a society and as an economy globally. Um, and companies on their own cannot solve the trust deficit on data. We need, well, what, the sort of things we have today, we need governments, civil society, citizens, and industry to come together to work towards a sustainable and global model for a trusted digital economy. And we've seen many governments active in this area. Well, Japan, for one, right, during both the G20 and then now, this year, with G7, with governments calling for frameworks that support the free flow of data with trust. And so, how do we do that? So, we think that governments and industry and other stakeholders can work together to accomplish this goal of marrying uh, cross-border data flows with trust, with the respect of privacy and, and users' expectations. And we need to think about public privacy frameworks that embrace the free flow of data, but avoid the most restrictive types of data lo localization which actually could threaten resilience and, and uh, you know, cyber stability. We need to think about how to have interoperable privacy frameworks, privacy laws. Um, we need to think about cybersecurity standards that are risk-based, that are practical, and to think about the mechanisms that underpin all that with cross-border enforcement of those mechanisms. And all of that will come through open, interoperable, and standards-based regulatory models. All this is, is feasible and it's in a process of happening. We've already seen progressive data transfer solutions in countries like Singapore, even Brazil, or Japan in the last few years, right? With each of those creating toolboxes for data transfer solutions. Um, that includes things like certifications or consent for adequacy agreements. And those sorts of approaches of, of toolboxes encourage uh, or promote trust and offer a range of options that companies can use in order to be uh, to offer privacy compliant uh, products and, 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 and solutions, including a cross border for the, the data flows. Uh, we've seen, and now we need to think about a sort of multi uh, country, multilateral uh, approach to all this. Um, and so there's a number of initiatives that we can consider. For instance, the global cross border privacy rules, CBPR system that's emerged recently, which is one of the important steps towards enabling a continued and trusted set of data flows between participating jurisdictions where we have interoperable uh, frameworks and protections that are valid across those borders. And, um, you know, if we do this right with these new, these new initiatives, these new collaborations, 
we can end up with increased confidence from users, from customers, from business partners. That's how we look at it, uh, at it as well. But if we also do it right, importantly, for all sorts of organizations, big and small, that work in this space, we can end up with reduced compliance costs because you have interoperable frameworks across your jurisdictions. We can have consistency of enforcement, which again is important for uh, companies uh, of all sizes. And again, if we do this right, we can have improved data security. And with all that, let me try and conclude with a, a focus. I mean, to me, it's all obvious that it should serve for development and the Global South, but we need to make sure that the Global South has the right voice. So we need, as we have those discussions at the international level about creating or fostering and taking on uh, interoper uh, interoperable uh, regulatory and, and, and standards frameworks, we need to make sure we have voices from developing countries from the Global South present. Um, we're lucky here at the IGF, as, as jean philbert was saying, that we have voices from across the world's regions. We need to have more of that in some of those fora where um, the, the, the global frameworks for uh, cross-border data transfers are, are being discussed. Countries from all over the world needs to, need to take their space. And that needs to translate then into, well, small and medium-sized companies or companies of all sizes in all countries of the world. I think the beauty of having interoperable standards and certification systems is that if they're done well with the right voices involved in developing them, they can be applied in any company potentially anywhere in the world and those companies can then trade and exchange data with anywhere else in the world. That's, uh, that's a real promise. I think we've already seen it in the past few years, but we need to reinforce it now in a system that's trust-based and that various jurisdictions can be comfortable with. So um, let, let me try and finish. I think you know, there's a bit of work to do, but uh, we've made a lot of progress in the last few years in trying to figure out what might be the right regulatory frameworks, what might be the detail of those uh, data protections and trust building initiatives that we can bake into um, uh, companies' practices through things like certifications. And now we just need to really broaden that model, deepen it, uh, raise awareness of it and make sure that the right voices are involved in taking it forward. So um, much, much more I'd love to discuss and hopefully we can move in, into that in the dialogue. Thank you again for having us. Thank you, thank you, Jack. Actually, he mentioned a lot of actually points, but I want to point out, uh, especially the compliance cost, I think, like interoperability frameworks, where everyone actually can abide by it, uh, would actually reduce the compliance cost. And another thing I would like to actually point out is, I think the importance of the voices from the developing countries to be part of the process. Because you know, oftentimes when you think about you know, this data flow, digital technologies, they are, their voice is not yet, I think, has been heard enough. But when you actually create that kind of framework, international framework with the best examples, they, they are the really the next future. Basically. So they are their voices and their inputs must be part of the process, as, and as well as the frameworks that we want to create. So thank you so much for the actually framing the discussions. Um, <clears throat> next, I'm previous actually, you know, since I'm a moderator, I could ask questions first. Um, since John Philibert, unfortunately, he's in Las Vegas right now, but not for gambling, but he has a very important conference on the health uh, conference, uh, but it's already almost 12 o'clock, 12 something for him. So let me actually ask him questions first, so he could actually go to sleep. Uh, so John Fieber, um, health sector is one of the key sectors where privacy, as you mentioned, is at most concern, right? Uh, however, in order to expand the health services, especially in developing countries where the needs are the most, um, it is critical to have the secure and safe data exchange. And you mentioned about you know, the health across the borders. You know, wherever you go, you should actually have a healthy environment. Do you think the developing countries who need these services the most need the establishment of such a regime? JP, can you hear me? Oh, maybe he went to sleep. <laughs> Joshua, are you there? Uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, I do not see him online any longer, so. Oh, he's, he's, he's gone? Yes. Oh, that's very unfortunate because we wanted to actually hear uh, the perspective of the health perspective, but okay. All right, so let's actually move on. Um, <clears throat> um, maybe we can ask him questions later on online. 
uh, as I, I can uh, basically, you know, put it into the report uh, when you actually compile the report. So maybe I can um, ask um, John Jack, maybe with JJ and JP, um, how can we ensure free flow of trusted data without compromising privacy and national securities? You mentioned that a lot about it. What should the roles of private sector like Google's, where they are the big data keeper, I wouldn't say hoarder, but the keeper, and also the support of the transactions, what the roles should be? It's a tough question, by the way. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it can, it can go in, into a lot of directions. I would say the way I look at it as a starting point is uh, one of the reasons I like to work for Google is that it sees itself as an information company. So through a lot of the products that we have, we allow people to access information, information that's relevant to them. Right? It's, it's the basic mission of the company is to try and, and help people uh, or make the information universally accessible and, and, and relevant to what users want. And deep down, that's what I care about, is, is being able to allow people to access that information. It, as, I, as I said earlier, um, this is not something that we've already, that we've always had. I grew up in a world that didn't have the internet. I think for some of us, um, that sounds weird. When we didn't have the internet, we had very limited access to information. And this was especially true in developing countries. The, the, the way that the internet has enabled us anywhere in the world to have access to tremendous amounts of information, but also some of the underlying technological aspects is just tremendous. And we should always keep that in mind. So then we get into, so that's, that's a, a role of, of uh, some of us uh, in, in, in the in industry where we can in help through our various tools and products for people to access information, which I think is, is an important dimension of the, the topic. Then what can we do in terms of trusted data flows? Of course, we can respect uh, the privacy principles, okay? And, and, and that's the gist of what I was saying. I think we're, we're in a situation where uh, there's a lot of understanding now of some of the key elements that should feature in good practice uh, privacy. And I think there's ways to encapsulate that in uh, good practice standards and certification requirements. And that's in process. But then there's the next step. The next step is, I was trying to allude to this, is we need to mainstream those protections. We need to help companies be aware of those basic protections. And so we need to work with especially small and medium-sized businesses, uh, and everywhere in the world. So we've put in a bit of money, for instance, as a, as a company to help uh, to fund some advisors that can help the companies in understanding better uh, the certification requirements, for instance, and how they can put it in place. And generally speaking, we're trying to use our various activities to engage with developers and, and, and sort of companies that are active uh, online to share uh, those practices uh, with, with a wider community. Then as we look ahead, I think we can think about how some of the products that we build, which are you know, privacy by design themselves, but could perhaps embed some of the good privacy practices and therefore be used um, by, by small, small and medium sized businesses. It doesn't have to be Google. I mean, there might be some specialist actors that develop tools that help companies uh, to, to, to sort of um, integrate those good practices in, in their day-to-day. Day, day day. So I think there's both a sort of uh, technical, operational angle to how we can help the wider um, industry to take up good practices, and then there's sort of evangelism, if you will, about making sure people are aware of what's out there. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, George Jack. I think that he's alluding to a very important point about mainstreaming. Uh, or some of the good practices. And I think, Gordon, I think government actually has a lot to actually work needs to be done in terms of advocacy, right? And he, well, John Jack was mentioning about uh, mainstreaming advocacies for private sectors, small and medium private enterprises, but to the citizens as well. How would you actually, what do you think the government, like in Rwanda or elsewhere, especially in developing countries, how could you, the government, could actually advocate and also trying to, the citizens to understand the benefits of you know the free flow of the, the data and then what data uh, enabled economy can actually bring to them and also how can you actually ensure that the security and also the privacy and trust underpinning this uh, DFFT is also being advocated 
and so they feel safe in that kind of environment. All right. Um, thank you, Tushi. Such a great question and a tough one. Um, I will start it off with uh, maybe uh, a scenario. Um, there is something which was mentioned uh, uh, around how development countries, developing countries rather, should be able to be part of the process. Um, I would rather mention that uh, the developing countries, or let me say economies, um, have the potential to actually lead, not just be part of the process, but also lead the process. Because um, the data understanding and the ecosystem and the way it is turning out to be is a kind of space that is still uncertain for most people. And everyone is struggling, everyone is learning. That's what I believe. And so this role goes in all directions, as you mentioned. Um, there is a role for governments, there is a role for private sector, there is a role for organizations, academia, and so on. And I wanted to highlight a few lessons we've learned, again, coming from the government, wearing the government hurt. Um, I just wanted to share a few highlights of what we've been doing, um, just to try and drive the point home. Because we need to, again, shift away from just discussing the ideal environment to an actual environment we are living in. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, we put in place uh, a data protection and privacy law in two years back. And we realized that actually just having a law was not enough. We had to do all the global benchmarks you can think of. And then we realized that actually having an instrument in place is not going just to be useful. We needed to also have more granular procedures and policies that are going to be easily understood by the consumers or by the people. And so we had to highlight the role of uh, those who could be data contributors, data controllers, data disseminators, to just to make sure that everyone knows their positioning. What is it that I can contribute to this topic? So that's one. Number two, we also realized that actually we needed to have a fully fledged institutions. And when I say institutions, I don't mean just the typical government institutions. You could be working in a private organization, you could be working in an um, international organization, regardless of the size of your company. You, there is, it is very important to be intentional in the way you structure your organization work and try to make sure that there are people who are dedicated to drive this whole discussion. So what we did back home, we put in place a fully fledged institution called a data protection office that sits under a national cyber security authority. And then we had to train people. Now, we realized that actually the largest part of the training we rendered was to be able to create a culture that tells people that your job is not to protect people. When we were hiring, when we started to train, everyone th thought my job is to protect data, is to be conservative, is to be to stay on data, don't touch the data. And people felt like we need to have a group of army and police officers around the data office. And it took to be intentional to tell people that actually their job is not to protect data, is rather to allow data to flow and protect privacy in the process. And it's different. So that's pretty much what we did. Um, and then also that came along with uh, awareness. As I mentioned, people first. Uh, you can have right policies in place. You can have um, institutions in place. You can have all these things. You can do awareness. But it is very important to be patient for people to be aware of this. We realize that the only sustainable way to drive this whole conversation is when people are taking their own ownership. If you're going to create single digital ID, which is something that we're doing, we realized, how do you make sure that people have data in their hands and they can allow authentication by themselves? And in the process, they become comfortable and start to realize that actually, with digital innovation that are coming up, with generative AI tools, it's all sitting on data. And our people, most people will not know. It is not just obvious. 
that people are going to know that when I'm using an AI tool, when I'm using any intelligent solution, actually at the back, it's powered by data. So not until you've driven the point home and people are very comfortable to understand that actually whatever you're doing is in the interest of the economy, is in the interest of people, then it's going to be sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon, for that. Actually, it's very, very important that the data owners, I think a, a lot of people do not, have, you know, they don't realize they are the data owner, you know, of their own data. And I think that was a very good example of how Rwandan government actually realized that and trying to advocate, yes, you are the data owners. Y yes, you are actually in the control. We keep the privacy, but we also help you to transact these data so that your life, your livelihood, is going to be much better than today. So I think that's a very, very important concept that we should advocate. That's also the right space, I suppose, right? Okay. So uh, that is very important. Now, what could like uh, developing partners could do to support that, okay? You know, because we're here, really, um, to support that. The private sectors, civil societies, academias, we're all here, right? But at the same time, we are here so that we could, you know, we could actually support developing countries in this, created this conducive mechanisms to take advantage of this. What do you think we could do to support them? Or of course, we, we would learn from them as well, from the experiences, but essentially, what can we do to actually co-create this environment? Yeah, so um, great question. And I think I'm gonna start by pushing back a little bit on this idea that the challenges are so different between developed and developing economies. Um, one of the things that I find most uh, fascinating about this question of how do you create more value for more people from data is that no, no country, no economic bloc has really figured out the perfect balance. And so I think you're right um, about global cooperation. I mean, if you look at my country, I work for a global organization, but I, I come from the US, and we still don't have a federal data protection law, much less a coherent approach to ensure that the value of data is fairly shared, right? And as Jean-Jacques well aware, if you look at the case that the US government is making right now against Google, it is all about access to and control of data. So these, this fundamental question of how do you balance those rights is I think um, something that nobody's figured out and that is a collective challenge that requires a huge amount of collaboration, um, both within policymakers, so multilateral institutions, but also bringing in all of the other data stakeholders, including civil society and of course the private sector. Um, I will just add one caveat to this, that I do think there's one issue that does play a little differently for um, people from developing economies, and that's the sense that data that is produced by people in their country is being monetized elsewhere without benefiting the local economy fairly. And so, you know, where we think about this tendency towards locking down data and data localization, we like to kind of easily tag that as a poor choice to national security concerns, but I think there is a real sense of exploitation that, that's fair and needs to be addressed, right? You know, all the more reason to ensure that the benefits of data flow both ways, right? Um, but to your question, I do think there's been very little investment uh, in trying to find the right governance models and mechanism, those rules and tools that I referred to earlier, that will give decision makers the confidence to enable cross-border data flows, right? There's been some good work to set up data trusts and data stewardship models, but they're really limited. Um, as John Jack said, you know, we're either operating in a commercial contract area or um, in academia or research, you're finding these bilateral kind of one-off agreements. Um, and so I think the time is, has come for, these, for us to settle on a few different broadly accepted, well-governed mechanisms that make data sharing the rule rather than exception, right? But to do that, you have to have all stakeholders at the table which I think is the role of, uh, of funders of multilateral organizations. 
and ensure that these um, conversations are not just multilateral between governments, but also multi-stakeholder, mm -hmm. right? Because everybody has vested interests here. Thank you, thank you, Kay. Yes, you're completely right in, in the sense that uh, I think it is really, you know, multi-stakeholders approach is necessary because conducive mechanisms we cannot create, like one entity cannot create conducive mechanisms. And if you want to really have a agreement or general consensus rather, not agreement, but consensus in order to actually promote the free flow of data, I think it is very, very important to have multilateral, uh, you know, stakeholders, multi-stakeholder approach that's like exemplified here in IGF. Uh, but also going back to, uh, you know, the data sort of colonialisms or maybe data oligopolies. I think this is, uh, you know, I work in mostly in developing countries and then I also feel this, that they feel like their data is being exploited. Um, and the flow of data or flow of information is skewed to one direction. So they really feel like, you know, they are being exploited. They actually have a lot of actual data, that, but they cannot actually capitalize this. So I think that particular point, I think, has to be rectified if we are going to really promote the free flow of untrusted data. Uh, so Miyata-san, um, you know, we are a bilateral organization, right? Bilateral organization, what should, organization like us, bilaterals, can actually support creating such sort of regime or as a ecosystem, maybe, to promote the you know, trusted data to flow. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Tsushi-san. Um, as we are uh, working uh, with the governments, uh, and also we're uh, kind of uh, development project practitioners, you know, working through projects. So, I mean, the the the, the debate uh, of the policy, like making a, a, the legal frameworks and all, I think this is done more uh, at the, um, uh, I mean, government to government level uh, through the uh, the ministries and and uh, pol uh, policy makers, but we are uh, I think we we are there to kind of pass the, those information updated and also what like what uh, Miss K has said that the all available tools uh, that makes uh, people confident to uh, pass the data to others that's also we can we can share and the things like what we just heard from the Rwanda case I, I think that a lot of the uh, government officials when I uh, that I'm interacting with they're quite uh, uh, yes, aware of the opportunities, that's no question, but for the risk, it's quite hard to uh, um, narrow down the, their, their risk that they're facing. So they kind of blindly block everything from outside and they're saying that, okay, all the data or concerning uh, uh, the government or, you know, it's concerning with the national security. So we'll, we'll put everything uh, in the, uh, physically in their territories or something like that. It's, it, it's it's not um, uh, well like studied like in Rwanda case you have benchmarked everything that's that's not the case for many countries so I think this kind of uh, good practices or uh, sharing uh, uh, the, yes what you just said the benchmarkings are, are quite important for us um, as a as a development partner uh, to, to uh, pass uh, this, this kind of information and knowledge, uh, and then also really uh, having dialogue with the government to what could be what is really the the focus risks that they uh, have to tackle in terms of national security, also in the personal information sphere. Yeah. Thank you, Mietasan, about that. <clears throat> so it's it's really how can you actually ensure that uh, we give them the right information and right tools, I think, for them to be comfortable on, you know, transacting data and so on. And for that, I think, John Jack, I think you mentioned about tools that uh, Google has created and all, uh, many other actually companies are creating. But at the same time, a lot of government is a concern because you hold a lot of data, you know, uh, probably you, Google knows more about, you know, me than myself. Right in, in this actually <laughs> devices that we all carry now right now, um, they know you know they know secrets uh, our secrets here. Uh, so how can you ensure that the right tools? How can you ensure like a company like Google's can give them the trust 
so that okay, yes, we could actually are comfortable actually transacting data, or, or basically, you know, they don't feel like they're being exploited. What what can you do to to ensure that? Uh, thanks, Osushi. Um, how many hours have we got? <laughs> uh, um, look, um, so I was mentioning before. I think we have. Over the years, I think we've got to a certain experience and understanding of what are some of the key uh, foundational elements, if you will, in terms of good practices in both privacy and security. So I think we need to embody that, to reflect that in both how we build our products and then in the ensuing sort of exchanges and transactions. So uh, that's an ongoing process. Um, Sorry, there's just so many facets of the question. I'm trying to think what would be most helpful. Um, I think in terms of, uh, you know, we were thinking earlier, I, I was listening to Gordon, and, and then someone made a point about doing things differently or not between the global south and the global north. When I'm listening to Gordon, I'm, uh, uh, he's doing the things that any country should be doing. doesn't matter where in the world. And so I think I, I wouldn't particularly uh, distinguish between different regions in that sense. I think although there are at some level privacy is a cultural connotation, so you might have some slight differences between certain cultures, there are those foundational elements that I think we can share generally, and I think we need to reflect that in cross-border mechanisms. So things that companies can build in their products and in their transactions, and that governments around the world are happy with because they're uh, mirrored uh, or interoperable frameworks across jurisdictions. So you have a baseline of protection and therefore of trust. But that, that needs to come with um, a set of other supporting policies. And here again, I've, I'll, I'll, Gordon has mentioned some, it's about raising awareness. And again, it, it's not about Rwanda. It's not, I think it's true in every jurisdiction, whether it's the US or Europe, etc. We need to build that understanding amongst users as well as in the, the, the business community about those principles and why they reinforce trust and how. So there's, there's quite a lot of work which is about policy initiatives be, beside the regulation. And then in terms of the, the sort of the ownership of data and you know, economic potential, if you will, I think we need to be mindful of realities, like uh, s simple examples, but with a lot of, of difficulties behind. Remember during COVID, well, we've been talking about health data, and there are certain health data that are very, very personal, so you might want to keep them localized. But then think about COVID. We had to be able to analyze data in order to come up with analysis of the trends of the pandemic and then come up with solutions to it. And that's true in most areas of medical research. So I think that's where the complexity goes. We need to, to not have, it's not a mannequin choice between yes, you should localize data or no, you, you should not localize data. It's about which kind of data, what can be helpful, how can you exchange it, what makes sense. And Again, I think there's a lot of evidence already about how you do that, but we, we need to have that conversation and, and build the, this understanding. And then you, you move on to the next step in terms of empowering certain regions. Um, it's not, again, just a choice of, um, yes, we should keep our data here or not. It's about what you're going to do with that data. So Jean-Philbert, for instance, mentioned IXPs, right? If you think about data flows, a lot of the internet traffic that is going in and out of Africa, actually transit via other regions of the world. That doesn't have to be the case, right? And it's not because the Europeans are somehow dictating where that traffic goes, it's just the way that it's worked historically for the past 20 years. It doesn't have to happen. You can build internet exchange points, you can have the, lo the data routed locally. That doesn't cost a lot of money, and actually then it saves a lot of money, and it can if it goes well, and it needs to be accompanied with public policy initiatives, it can reinforce local content creation, it can uh, reinforce local economies, et cetera. So I think that's where you need to think about it as a strategy, not as a regulatory approach, but as an overall public policy strategy within which there's regulation and within which there's cross-border uh, cooperation. Sorry, that's a, a lot of... I <laughs> well, I, I know that I'm actually giving a hardball question. So that's uh, the beauty of actually inviting company like yours, you know, Google, to actually be part of this discussions. But 
you know, a lot of actually, I won't actually go into the discussion of infrastructures, but before I go into it, a lot of actually data discussions, uh, data transaction discussions is actually, you know, even today, I think it's all about the economy. And then, you know, let's agree, like health and so on. But they're actually beyond that. You know, some of the data flows, I think is beyond that, such as like climate data, that we all need to share all this data. Or like some other, for example, forest data, you know, data is about waters and so on. That actually is a global public goods, isn't it? So that's also is some of the elements that we need to think about it. Not only the data, you know, transaction for the economy, but can you do actually data transaction for global goods? So Miyata-san, <coughs> you were actually mentioning about Soria before we did uh, discussions, uh, briefing sessions. Do you think you can give us an example of such, uh, you know, the data transactions or sharing of data which goes beyond uh, just simple economies or simple uh, you know, social benefits, the global benefits? Um. Yes, um, maybe uh, as earlier speakers have mentioned, COVID uh, was one good example. And uh, with our experience, we had a telemedicine project during the COVID-19 with 12 countries. And uh, maybe it, uh, this could be one <laughs> area that I can share. Uh, so this project connect connected uh, medical staff working for ICUs in top hospitals in each country. And we had a number of IC ICU specialists to advise other ICU doctors and nurses on particular patients uh, that hospitals were dealing. And in this project, we had um, we had a kind of a legal uh, bind binaries because like for example, in Indonesia, they, the hospitals could not take any of their data outside their hospitals, not even their, uh, their frontier. <laughs> so we had to make a legal agreement that we don't uh, the, we don't touch on uh, their data. And then, so like as uh, earlier speaker said, uh, some of the information we actually, we had system to connect uh, directly to their uh, electrical uh, medical record system, but uh, we couldn't because of this uh, legal uh, limitation. Um, and then, so I think maybe there are, there are certain uh, ways, of course, technically to, to tackle that we don't uh, draw the uh, inf uh, personal information and then uh, just uh, important elements that is needed in the, in the doctor's diagnosis or, or uh, maybe have a statistical data to, for the global trend. But if um, I think that, um, the, 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 yes, it's uh, if we could, um, um, yeah, I think if we had a kind of uh, framework or certain agreements globally that we, or some kind of standard, we could have made this project much more easily. <laughs> so this was something that we learned. And I think for the, the environmental uh, uh, information, as uh, Atushi-san mentioned, like forestry, forestry, this kind of data also I heard in some countries that are very restricted because of the national security reason. And so, yes, of course, it's important when this disaster happens, for example, like the fire out outbreak, but the countries are not uh, really ready, uh, like uh, at this stage, uh, I think that uh, to share everything like that uh, in one hand. So maybe this, uh, this is uh, what I can say from my side. Back to you. Thank you, Miata san it's Actually, that's actually is a good, nice segue into the public goods discussions. I think some of these data should be public goods as well, I think. And also, John Jack mentions about infrastructures, you know, creating IXP in, in Africa, for example. Our common friends like in ICANN, uh, he's really pushing for that. But should that discussions, should the data flow would be also part of the discussions about the digital public goods or digital public infrastructure that we've been all talking about throughout this year, you know, with the G20, uh, the <coughs> presidency of India is really pushing for digital public infrastructures and also digital public goods. So, okay, should this concept of free, free a flow of trusted data should be part of the DPI, DP discussions? I know you're passionate about that, so. <laughs> Yes, well, I've been waiting uh, for a few weeks for this question, so thank you. Um, wholehearted yes. Um, 
you know, as, as Atsushi-san mentioned, um, digital public infrastructure as a policy priority has gotten a huge boost in the last year thanks to uh, India's G20 presidency. And if you look online for this phrase, digital public infrastructure, if it's not, um, if it's not uh, familiar to you, you'll find um, that in a nutshell, it, it refers to an approach to using open protocols and open standards to building out highly inclusive foundational layers of national tech stacks, right? In the shorthand for DPI, it's usually considered um, the kind of trifecta of digital identity systems, digital payment systems, and then secure data exchange. And the key, of course, is that they have to be designed, deployed, and governed to be um, highly inclusive. They have to serve uh, both um, public sector service delivery, but also private sector innovation. And they have to be interoperable to do all of this. And so, you know, countries like Estonia kind of came up with this approach, um, you know, decades ago. Um, and then in the last 10, 15 years, India has really brought it to scale. And some of the impact that we've seen there is quite extraordinary in terms of radically accelerating um, financial inclusion, right, and um, dramatically uh, improving service delivery something that they found very, very helpful during the pandemic when governments around the world were looking for um, mechanisms to be able to seamlessly uh, get um, social protection or stimulus payments um, to folks to help them keep going. And so if you think about the goal of digital public infrastructure, it's really to enable um, the production of data that is highly relevant to solving global problems, right? Whether it's around financial resilience or health data, you can, by creating these DPIs that reach more people, not only are you getting more data, you're getting more representative data, right? And I think especially as we, you know, um, kind of speed into the generative AI era, having that highly representative data of the realities that people face is going to be increasingly important to making sure AI tools work for everyone. And again, that then is linking interoperable, highly representative data within countries and ensuring that it can easily move across borders when needed and as appropriate. And so I think absolutely we should, you know, as this momentum is growing, for digital public infrastructure scaling, um, we should absolutely be embedding the concept of cross-border data flows and how you harmonize them into that. And then did you want me to say a word about digital public goods? No, sure. Okay. <laughs> we also want to give a floor, you know, the yeah, questions. Yeah, of course. So, just, so just very quickly, these two, DPI and DPG in my world are often kind of used together and, and sometimes conflated. And a digital public good is really an open solution that can be reused and improved by different countries. And it's improving an increasingly popular way to build digital public infrastructure. And it's interoperable and designed you know, uh, with privacy in mind. So, so it's got some challenges, but a lot of, uh, a lot of upside. Thank you so much. I think the benefits of actually D DFFT and DPI and DPG, I think we all agree on that. But how can you, Gordon, how can you actually, you know, like developing countries could put together the voices together so that they could really shape the discussions and have a meaningful input which would, you know, which would benefit actually developing countries. How can you actually put these voices together? And then I promise you I'll open up the floor after him. Uh, thank you, Ashish-san. Um, I feel like at this stage you'd love to hear more from the audience. Um, but just to shed light on two things which crossed my mind with your question, uh, you know, and again, in a way, to summarize. Um, going continental, um, allowing data to flow across continents, across the globe, I think one of the ways is to 
leverage the support from countries, first of all, and then international organizations to put in place common protocols, tools, and processes, and frameworks, or policies. That's very key. Every time you want to engage a country or an external organization that involves two countries, often the discussion around laws and pol policies comes on top. So as we think through how to build a strong uh, data ecosystem um, that is going to be much more sustainable, we need to be intentional in, again in the way we create those policies that are going to make everyone comfortable countries. And thankful uh, we are here um, in a forum like this. We need more of these forums. We need more discussions. We need to see the role of private sector, which was my second point. Um, in my earlier uh, remarks, I dwelt much on what the government is doing, but I would love to, this time, pass the challenge to private sector. What is it that you can do? How can you help emerging economies to be strong in terms of tools, in terms of processes, in terms of policies? And also, what we've learned as something that is important is to drive this conversation with um, useful tools. You know, every time, again, you the, the, the one of the easiest ways to get people to understand the value of data is when you have a tool that is powered with data being used. So we need to have a deliberate focus on promoting more innovations as countries. We need to see private sector, academia, organizations, companies come work with governments and specifically emerging economies to tap into those opportunities to create very transformative digital tools that are going to help people. And with that, then the discussion around allowing data to flow, releasing data from different ministries, could be health, could be agriculture, could be education. The discussion is, much, is gonna be much more easier. So in a nutshell, I think for us, we've had our own test as a country. Um, this is an open invitation to everyone that is here. We are much more welcome to Rwanda. Um, come, let's have this discussion. Um, let's create champions on different blocks. Sometimes it works when you create champions. Um, I'm not gonna be shy to say that Rwanda is happy to be a champion. We are more than happy to be that. So anyone here in the room, you're more than welcome to visit Rwanda, the land of a thousand hills. We are focused on data, thank you. Well, thank you for the promotions of Rwanda, by the way. Uh, but I, as I promised, I will open the floor for questions. Oh, yeah, well, people are. <laughs> so, please. Yes, yes, please. Actually, you have to stand over there. It, it is uh, to the mic. Otherwise, yeah. well, we have so many questions. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if the organizer would allow us, actually, to entertain so many questions. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, hi, everyone. My name is Shilpa. I am a researcher at University of Melbourne. And uh, my focus, focus of my research is cross-border data. And I also work on open government data. And I come from India. And I found really interesting your point that you know you were giving, you're talking about DPIs coming from India, especially India, India stack and Aadhaar problem. I mean, Aadhaar, we started with like the UPI system, digital internet identity systems, etc. And after doing that, you know, in between, we had the problem of privacy and problem of like, what if the government is surveilling us? What if they're misusing the data? And then we, we had this one judgment uh, which set up the privacy standards for us because as far as people know that, you know, India just came out with the Data Protection Act. Before that, we didn't have, we had like set total rules and policies, but then now we have a completed. I mean, like before that, you know, it was this judgment which basically laid down guidelines for us, and it limited the access of this data, right? It did not talk about like sharing of data even among the 
uh, government organization. Forget about sharing with outside of India. So that's that's one point that I wanted to clarify. And uh, the so the question is, sorry, uh, it's it's just a point I wanted to make oh, okay, because right. uh, so and and the question is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry, that's I'm that's so sorry. And then you know, since since beginning of the panel, like you know, and I find this panel really interesting because you know you're you are talking about cross border data and open data. Like, why do you need to talk about open data when we're talking about cross border data? Because data can flow, but it doesn't need to be. In a, in a data set. I mean, like, who are we helping if we're creating data sets? Are we really helping governments? Are we really helping domestic in industries? Are we helping giant corporates like Google? <laughs> so I think, I think the panel maybe got a little, I don't know, I was sort of seeking some clarity, but I never got it. So I thought, like, I'll just give you this so opportunity. So the question is, the clarity between the open data as well as to the, the free flow of data. I think we, do, who, who do you want to actually ask the questions do you find it? I mean, anyone can can in reply, and Ooh, then you know, like I and and I just wanted to like give you this food for thought that you know, I hope you know that you know we have this massive in problem of privacy invasion, and uh, uh, predictive advertising, which is about mm -hmm. collecting as much as data as possible by corporates, so that they can sell us more products and services, even when we don't want it. So when we talk about like creating <laughs> data sets and giving you, it outside you, the border, uh, yes, who are we really helping at this point? Yes, yes. No, thank you so much, actually. So maybe we can actually have a few questions because otherwise we never finish and they're going to kick us out. So Go ahead. please, actually. So the question number one is the difference between the open, open data and, uh, and the DFFT. And the question number two. Oh, hello, everyone. My name is Tevin Gitonga, and I work actively on the topic you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I work for a development agency. That's the Jam German Development Corporation, and I work mm -hmm. on, I had a data governance team, and I'm from Kenya, where I was basically hired to figure out how does a development agency work with a data mm -hmm. protection authority. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've been doing for the last two years. And one of the things that I, maybe I was curious about is a few, like two weeks ago, we had an interesting event where we brought about the East African Data Commissioners together. Unfortunately, Rwanda wasn't there, but we had Uganda, Tanzania, uh, Uganda, and the discussion was on data flows and exactly what you're discussing here. And perhaps what I'm trying to figure out, and maybe you can help me figure out my assignment, is what's the best option? Because we had, we had the data commissioners, we had private sector, both international and local, we had civil society. And we are trying to discuss what's the best option for an emerging economy. Because what was clear was for the developed economies, there are different versions. There's the data free flow is trust, I think, led by Japan and the EU. There's the CPBR by the US. There's a, also the Chinese version of closing all the data. And perhaps what I'm trying to figure out is, do we need a new version for eco developing countries? Which version aligns to best to economies that are at very different levels growing? There are laws at a very different levels from, from, I'm talking about ground lessons of what I do on a daily basis here. Things are very different. We have, for example, in Africa, the FTA that's coming up that has a whole clause on digital trade. And perhaps, so my question <laughs> is, what, yes. what is a suggested solution? So, so the question is, so yes. what it should, it should it be actually a new set of rules set for developing countries? Yes, that's for what the I'm Okay. So, Please, actually, very concise. Like, I will give you 30 seconds for the same questions. What do you think are the risks of taking a deductive global approach to global frameworks, global rules, global protocols? I, I see a tension between the way the abstract question is being framed about balancing uh, protection against free flow mm -hmm. with the kind of very specific uh, needs and examples we're hearing uh, from, from, from people like this gentleman. Uh, what that balance looks like will be different mm -hmm. in every case, infinitely, mm -hmm. depending on which countries, what type of data, what the incentives are in the market for private uh, companies, uh, what the culture is, social trust, digital, digital literacy, uh, uh, media access, all of this. And if we want, as, as you said in Rwanda, mm -hmm. the, the solutions to be economically sustainable and driven by need, is it a mistake? Are there risks, either uh, practical or, or normative, in mm -hmm. pursuing global frameworks? Thanks. Thank you. So the question is, risk of deductive approach protections versus free-for-all information. Right? Go ahead. 
Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Taichiro Fujina. I'm a fellow uh, hero of the JPNEC, uh, dealing with IP address in Japan. My question is about a mechanism for building trust in multilateral environment. In general, uh, uh, trust in security and safety will be achieved by a norm standard and Importantly, a uh, law enforcement. For instance, when Google leak my information, then I can accuse of Google, or maybe Google will pay fine to my government. So that's really easy. But on the other hand, in multilateral uh, environment, we need to trust that uh, the counterpart will delete or do something for me, right? So what my question is, again, uh, what is the mechanism for building trust in DFFD okay. or multilateral environment? That's all. So the question is, is mechanism of creating trust in the DFT. Okay, perfect. And then? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm Ibrahim Mohammed Mohammed from Nigeria, a digital asset officer from Office uh, National Information and Technology Development Agency as a uh, scholar, the JICA scholar as well. Oh, my, I, we have had, it is crucial, important when it comes to data, privacy, security, and, uh, uh, but my concern is I have not had like uh, transparency when it mm -hmm. comes to processing the data. Because for you to end trust, there is need for you to explain to us how you utilize our data, how it's being processed. So that's my concern. And okay, the question that, is, how can you ensure transparency in the data transfer? To end trust, yes. Okay. Please. Hello, I'm um, very interesting um, panel. Thank you so much. My name is Minako Morita Yega, University of Sussex in the UK. My question is, what kind of data governance is suitable to achieve DFFT, especially for development? The reason I said that is I observe that ignoring the different type of data governance existing in the world, it's, um, DFFT is not achievable. Let's say there are three types of data governance in the world now, the market-driven type, to which the U US is a promoting, and then on the other hand, human rights, human rights centric approach that which the EU is promoting, and then um, state driven um, data governance which the China is promoting. And I observe so many developing countries is following China, the state driven approach, where the, so many, you know, the um, uh, strictly measurement of the local requirement or the open source code requirement and so on. And then without discussing it, I think the FFT is impossible. Thank you. So the thing. question is what kind of data governance models that should is, be available yes, based right. on these three? So 30, 10 seconds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Hassan Habib. I'm from uh, Djibouti. I'm uh, also Jaga scholar. So my, uh, my question is about the youth, like how you want them be more included in such kind of process, how the opportunities that you perceive are like you saw for this uh, kind of, uh, in the DPI and the and, uh, data public uh, problem. So, so thank you so much. Sorry, how, how are the opportunities of using DPI? Okay. Yeah, in like, inclu oh, include for the use. Kind of, yes. So what are the, okay, oh, sorry, Chris. Yeah, hello, I'm Javier Ruiz from Consumers International. I have a very brief comment, which is that I hope that the next time we have a panel talking about consumers, we have more consumer organizations there because I'd be like a panel on gender, not having any women would feel a bit weird, you know, so hopefully for the next one we'll get more representation from a broader uh, constituency. My question is actually mainly uh, for Jean-Jack and Google. Um, because Google is supporting CVPR quite publicly. Your privacy council last year came out. But one question is like, are you certified? And with the previous APEC regime, and it's not like a, particularly the question is, we've been, I was looking at the reasons why companies sometimes don't certify and there are costs, but also the fear of the audit, you know, that you actually have to open up your systems, you know. And that's, uh, so it would be interesting, you know, from a very large company, how do you see private certification working, you know, as a scalable global thing, you know? Mm -hmm. If, as I understand, you haven't actually certified in the system that you are <laughs> proposing. And then the, um, but more importantly, do you think that actually if the FTC and all the governments in the world are actually struggling to deal with Google, that a private certification agency in a small country will be able to actually handle any issues? And how can we solve so that? The issue is basically how can you actually see the private certifications, especially in developing countries? Well, how can you deal with um, private certifications when the FTC is struggling to deal with Google? How can a small 
private certification this agency. I mean, I think it's a very it's important because not in every country you have a state, um, a good state infrastructure to make companies accountable, but for a small private companies, you know, it may be hard to actually deal with okay. a company like Google. Thank you. So, yes. So, Chrissy, I think I'm, I will also give like a few, can you actually summarize some of the questions so that we can throw at the panels here? Absolutely. We had a few questions on data localization, which I think were perhaps answered in the discussion, but I will say um, in between how do we but you know, have data localization without making fragmentation more serious? Um, what is the role of the organization spearheaded by Japan called the Inter Institutional Arrangement for Partnership, the IAP? Another question on how does the SWIFT system and the new financial transaction system um, spearheaded by the BRIC member nations going to fit in to all of this? Uh, same with uh, the country-led efforts to have their own digital currencies, CDBC, how will that fit? Um, those were the main questions from the audience. Thank you, Chrissy. So I will stop the questions here. So can I actually answer, I think there's questions about the governance models. Um, anyone would like to actually take the questions on that? Okay, so I completely agree with that um, paradigm, the global sort of landscape that the professor laid out. And I would say that's exactly why there's a need and an opportunity for countries to take a fourth way, right? Especially emerging economies that um, have a lot to benefit from thinking about data as a strategic asset. They don't need to follow the full on laissez faire model of the US, but I would certainly hope that there are options that are better for the economy and better for society than following a state-driven approach. Okay. Uh, transparency for data and the uh, rule of law for new rule of law, would you like to take it? Okay, so, <laughs> uh, Yes, so yes to transparency. Uh, obviously with a lot of detail underneath that could be discussed. I think just linking it to the, a couple of the points that were made by other um, other people in the room, we do, even though there are certain different systems, there are some basic elements that I think most people would agree with in terms of what does good look like in terms of both privacy and security, and I think transparency is part of that. Um, and we shouldn't shy away from, uh, there was a question about global versus local, right? It's very difficult to get to a full global um, solution very quickly, but you can you can start by building bridges between between certain countries and hopefully grow. If you if you look at a um, it's not a perfect comparison, but still in the security world we've seen some some uh, good standards emerge over the years. You know ISO type standards for cybersecurity that are now pretty well accepted, frankly worldwide. I don't think there's any reason. Apart from, you know, uh, there are cultural differences here and there, as I've mentioned before, but I still think that we can get to a situation where you have at least a pretty good baseline of good practices in privacy as well, in a similar way as what we've seen uh, happen with security. So it's going to take some more work, but I, I do think it's, it's feasible. Uh, I don't think it has to be a different system for developing countries versus developed countries, because actually that's a big risk. Uh, of of uh, having you know disparities and perpetuating disparities. Um, I, th I think that, that answers the questions about yeah. laws and the governance models, right? And also the transparencies and then also certifications as well. I think. In the uh, I'm sure there's more uh, that people want to explain. Well, I'll talk about it, but I think uh, that's also part of the answers. Would you like to actually add on that? Yeah, um, just two things. Um, one, uh, there is a question which caught my attention around uh, the role of the youth. I think came from you. Um, there is something we are doing back home and realize that actually every time you have the kind of population where over 70% are the people that are below 35 years, there is a very strong role they can play in terms of leading the way uh, into this industry, I would say. Uh, one, because they are users, they are consumers, they are troublemakers, let me say that. And so everything you're doing could be policies or laws. It is very important to, f to get these people at the center stage. 
So yes, there is a very strong role of the youth into this discussion. Um, the other one which I wanted to contribute to is around the transparency. Again, one thing we've learned is that often uh, people share away, one of the reasons why people are not transparent is not because they're hiding something that is harmful or they're just intentionally um, planning something against you. One thing we've learned is that uh, every time could be institutions or organization or a department is, you, you see them not comfortable to share data or they're processing data and the process is not a little bit clear is because of the quality. So every time you're dealing with low quality data and people are not comfortable to put in limelight the results, then the easiest thing to do is to share away and hide. So as we discuss this, I think, which is an element we had not talked about, as, the, uh, as we attempt to put in place policies, as we attempt to push data to flow, it is very important to build quality data as, as well. Because with quality data, that's one of the ways that is going to make people more comfortable to open, even be more transparent. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, they're going to kick us out. So, <laughs> well, I wanted to actually get the final words from them, but I think they're going to kick us out because there's going to be next session. So thank you so much for participating in this very important discussions. Please give a round of applause uh, for the rest of the team. And the discussion should continue. Thank you so much.